I'm Jane Fenn. I write science fiction and fantasy. I'd like to read you a short story today, which is actually sort of a retold fairy tale. Down at the lake. Dawn already. Cold, too. Winter's on its way. As I stumble back up the slope to the cottage, my feet break through a crust of frost. Freezing mud squelches up between my toes, thick and chill and sticky. There's no smoke coming from the chimney. Damn it, Papa. Have you let the fire go out again? A shadow passes over the sun and I shiver. Before I can catch it, the shiver becomes a shudder, something beyond a mere reaction to the cold. Even as I wonder where this sensation comes from, it's gone again, and all that matters is getting inside, where I can be dry and warm. The cottage is empty, but I should have expected that. Last night, Papa was so pumped up with his great victory that he swept out without a word. He must still be over the far side of the lake, gloating. Oh dear, you poor, tragic birdies. Sorry, Princess, looks like you got your hopes up for nothing. What a shame. I just wish Papa would give me some credit for his triumph. I dance until my feet bled. Or perhaps he's avoiding me because of what I found out yesterday. How spells work both ways. Black needs white and night needs day. It's all about balance. Pay a price and gain a reward. There's a lot of crap talked about magic. To hear the villagers prattle on, you'd think Papa could pull gold coins and fine linen from the very air. If only. You need to start with the right raw materials. You can't just magic things away either, which is why, between the fabric, beads, paint and knives, Papa used to make me look the part, and the crusty plates, cobweb corners and unwashed laundry that built up while he was enchanting and I was practising, this particular sorcerer's cottage is a stinking hovel. I need clothes. Up in my room I find and pull on a fairly clean kirtle, drab brown and warm, but warm and familiar, on bare skin. While I fasten my dress, I find myself looking at the shapeless frock hanging on the back of the bedroom door. Today, it's coarse black fabric sewn with cheap glass stones. Yesterday, I dazzled the courtiers in midnight satin and blood-red rubies, fitted to show every curve. I looked amazing. I was amazing. And Papa was so proud. But that was then. In daylight, the romance and the magic drains away. Well, not entirely. If he'd given me the choice, I would have kept the dress and lost the face. This incy wincy mouth would look better on a trout than a girl, and these wide trusting eyes make me look like a lost puppy. Shame magic sticks to flesh better than it does to cloth or glass. So I'm left with a peasant's costume and a princess's looks, at least while the sun's up. I imagine I'll get used to it. May as well tidy up. Anything to stop him going into one of his strops when he gets home? I know him. After the party, the come down. Despite the success of this latest scheme, he'll be off again soon enough, pacing and muttering over injustices only he remembers, raging about vengeance for ancient slights. If only I could stop thinking about Siggy. That wasn't a side effect either of us foresaw. It's so dumb. He's so dumb. But the silly boy is also very cute. And he's Prince, of course, a real live blue blood. No brain, but buttocked prince. When Papa gets back, I'm going to ask when I can see him again. After all, he loves me now. Naturally, he'll want to see me again. He can't end here. And if I do go back to the palace to see Siggy again, then that would make the revenge all the sweeter. That's what I'll say as soon as Papa gets home. While I wait, I light the fire. I sweep the floor while the water's heating. Then I put the plates in to soak wash some socks and shirts, and finally have a go at scraping Papa's work table clean, though it'll take more than warm water to shift all this fat and dried blood. When the sun starts to stink, sink behind the trees, and there's still no sign of Papa, I begin to fret. Remembering the old feeling, odd feeling I had this morning, it's a wise sorcerer's daughter that listens to her intuition, I put on a cloak and shoes and go out. I know where he'll be. I'm in such a hurry to get round the lake that it's a while before I notice how empty the water is. Not a swan in sight, even though it's still light. Something's wrong. On the far side, I come across footprints. Footprints made by delicate, girly feet, the sort born to wear embroidered slippers and be carried across thresholds by adoring princes. Dozens of pairs, all running away from the lake. Which can mean only one thing. The birds have flown. Or rather, not being birds anymore, run off. 
My heart begins to patter. I call Papa's name but get no answer. I won't panic. A sorcerer's daughter never panics. Then I find him. He's lying face down in the reeds. I almost stumble over his body. A noise, an ugly, thoughtless squeal, breaks from my throat. Birds burst up from the willows at the sound. Then I'm crying, the tears rolling off my face like the first fat drops of a summer storm. After a while I get control again and make myself look more closely. His right wing is broken and he's been shot through the heart with a crossbow bolt. A crossbow bolt? Siggy? I never thought my silly, pretty prince had it in him. That's love for you. Not love for me, though. I know that now. I might have turned his head when I danced for him in the glow of Papa's magic, but the one he really wanted was her, the leader of the cursed princesses. Her white innocence, her effortless grace, her pathetic need. He killed my Papa to free the stinking princess from Papa's enchantment. And it worked, too. Her and all the other girlies back in human form all the time, no longer doomed, ha, doomed, to be swans in the daylight. I start crying again. This time the tears are all for me. I don't fight them. When I came out of the lake this morning, I had a father, not a good or loving father, but the only one I've ever known, and the love of a prince, or so I thought. Turns out I don't have either. I rage at the trees, the sparrows, the reeds. I curse the world. The world ignores me. Finally, I run out of anger and tears. I sniff, then drag Papa's body down to the shore. On his left side, he's got an arm, not a wing. And I wonder what this means. After all, if murdering him lifted the curse on the princess and her cronies, what will it do to me? They were normal girls once, back before Papa found them. I don't think I was ever a normal girl, not given the way Papa changed the subject whenever I mentioned mothers or birthdays. Now he's dead, so the spell's broken and they're human all the time. What about me? Do I ever spend the rest of my life as this leggy, flightless girl thing? But when the last flashes of the sun disappear behind the mountains, I feel the familiar tingle, soft as downy feathers, urgent as the need to pee. I hurry to get Papa into the water. As soon as he's free of the shore, the lake pulls him out of my hands. He slips silently down into the dark, chill depths. My skin is crawling now. I undo my cloak, pull my dress over my head and wade out further. Tiny buds of black are bursting out all over my body, unfurling into sleek feathers, a thousand pinpricks becoming dark flowers. I raise my chin and my neck grows longer, filling my head with the sound of cracking bones. My knees twitch, then break cleanly and start to heal themselves reversed. It hurts. Every time I forget how goddamn much it hurts until it happens again. But it's a good pain. It's the pain that makes me what I am. At the final moment, I sweep my arms back, and now they're no longer arms, but wings. I plunge headfirst, test first into the water. When I come up, I'm a swan, black as a moonless night. For a while, I simply glide around, listening to the night calls and the gurgles and the splashes, the life of the lake. It isn't that I can't think when I'm a swan. It's just that I can't be bothered to. I see light on the water, a sudden burst of gold, shockingly pretty. For a moment, the sight foxes me. Then I realise it's a reflection and look up just as a red flower explodes above the trees, its mirrored twin glittering in the surface of the lake. Fireworks. Fireworks to celebrate a royal wedding. Well, they didn't waste much time. Fall in love one day, marry the next. Hell's curse on them both. Then suddenly I know why there, why she's in such a hurry. Another thing people don't know about magic is that there are some forces it just can't stop, like death or time. Or we can make people think nothing's changing, stick a nice comfortable illusion in front of reality. Magic can even put some things on hold for a while. But in the end, there's always a price to pay. I don't know how old I am, but since I've started counting the years, I've been through my fingers and toes twice and I'm back to fingers again. The white swans have been living on the far side of the lake for as long as I can remember. And Papa told me once that she was their leader because she's the oldest of them all. Now Father's dead and the spell's broken. Given I'm a swan again, it would seem I've enough magic of my own to keep me going. But as for her, any day now, time's going to start catching up with her. I bet she can feel it in her bones. She knows she doesn't have long. That's why she's so desperate to wed my Siggy at once. 
It might be a week, a month, maybe even as much of a year. But one morning soon, my poor brave fool of a prince will wake up to a woman older than his grandmother. Let's see true love survive that. I can wait. It'll happen, sure as night follows day. When it does, I'll be here. After all, we swans mate for life. Times like this, I almost wish I had a mouth to smile with.